Tony Kushner is here. A decade ago, he won the Pulitzer Prize for Drama with his play Angels in America. It has now been made into an HBO film directed by the great Mike Nichols. Here is a clip from the film. A homosexual with AIDS. I can just imagine what you... No, you can't. Imagine the things in my head. You don't make assumptions about me, mister. And I won't make them about you. <laughs> Fair enough. I am pleased to welcome Tony Kushner back to this table. It's nice, nice to, to be you. here. Nice to be you. She's amazing, isn't she? She's terrifyingly talented. That's what you I said. Mean, you said yeah. she's inhumanly talented. When yeah, we looked it's, at her. it's really scary to watch her work because she becomes another person entirely. And, and the woman that you meet when you meet Meryl Streep sort of disappears. And yeah, it's, it's true. thrilling. Yeah. You had good, I mean, Michael, Mike Nichols had good luck in casting this thing, didn't he? Yeah, I don't know if it was luck. I mean, I think well, that's his... Fair, his, fair to say, his, that's what he does. Yeah, I mean, he... Actors who work with him, Meryl's made, I think, three movies with him, four now, yeah. I, more than with any other director, and everybody wants to work with him, so pretty much anyone he asked said they'd do it. Now, why did it take so long to get this movie made? Um, I worked with Robert Altman for a while on it, uh, right when we were moving the show to Broadway. And um, I think for a long time it was uh, seen as something that would have to be made as a theatrical film by a studio. And uh, the fact that it's seven and a half hours long, uh, at some point in the mid-90s, I tried to compress it to see if there was any way to make it short enough to make one film out of it. And you can't really do that, because there are seven, eight major characters. Um, and uh, Carrie Brokaw, really, is the person who, the hero of this whole story. He uh, worked with Altman on The Player and uh, was working with us together on the film. And then when Altman and I decided not to do the film together, uh, Carrie kept it in his back pocket for 10 years, and he uh, produced Wit with right. Mike on HBO and called me in the middle of the filming of Wit and said, can I show this to Mike? And I said, sure, because I thought... Show him the treatment. Actually, just show him the, the play and right. say, I, I, I represent this, I, I have the rights for this, and I'd like to do it. Um, and, you know, Mike had seen it on Broadway, but yeah. you know, everybody had sort of assumed, I think, because so much time had passed that, the, that it was over and done with, it wasn't going to happen. And he read the play again and, and said, I think I'd like to do this, which is a decision that even to this day I don't completely understand because he must have known that it was going to be a monstrous job. And it turned out to be. It was a year of filming and two years of post-production. I mean, it really uh, took a lot out of him. But And the actors are just brilliant. Yeah. Streep and Pacino. And it's astonishing Wright performances. And, and the way it's filmed is glorious. And I think that because... Um, He's uh, so brilliant at what he does, you don't quite notice how, um, I mean, he made the translation from stage to film seem sort of effortless, and in fact, it's anything but. I mean, I didn't really think this would work as a film, and I think he made it into a successful now, For film. example, one thing in terms of the play, you'd have an actor walk from one scene into another scene. Yeah. Just walk from one... How does he accomplish that on film? I mean, he does it with a lot of editing, and, and uh, I mean, Altman pointed out something when we were working on it. He said, the, the difficulty with this is that, uh, in a sense, what you've written is a screenplay and put it on stage. And what's sort of shocking about it on stage is you have two scenes going on at once, and you, the audience is going back and forth. And, you know, when you mo move that into film, it's going to be sort of ordinary, because it'll just look like a scene with cutting. Um, and, and Mike sort of acknowledged that and just stepped right over it. I mean, I think that it's, it loses some of the kind of um, the shock value that it had on stage, but in place of that, there's just astonishingly beautiful uh, filmmaking. The photography is gorgeous. So. Is it as relevant today as it was when you wrote it? I was worried about that because it was, ten, I mean, we started the thing about 13 years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, I wasn't sure, but um, I think that it is, and pretty much everybody who's writing about it seems to say that it is. I mean, for one thing, we're still, in a certain sense, in the Reagan era. I mean, those people just transferred from, you know, they took a few years off in right-wing think tanks while Clinton was in the White House, but now they're all back. And we're still, I think, struggling with a lot of the same issues. Um, and and uh, uh, there's still ideological battles that um, took place during the 80s that are ongoing. And of course, the AIDS epidemic has become now a global pandemic. So many of the issues that the play uh, dealt with that seemed topical at the time are still topical. 
Also, you know, the play is about love and betrayal and identity and confusion and the lies you tell yourself and those things. <laughs> the things that on. lives are about. Things that go on forever. <laughs> we'll be still wrestling with those things, you know, a hundred years from now. So I, the play yeah. seems to have uh, um, at least lasted ten years. Are we years. worse off today with respect to AIDS than we were oh, yeah. ten years ago? I mean, because uh, it really has genuinely become a... Pandemic. A pandemic. I mean, it's it's the the consequences of AIDS in Africa and possibly in Asia and India are are incalculable. I mean, when you read the statistics, I mean, an entire generation really of people in their twenties and thirties who um, will more than likely die the way people used to die in the eighties before new treatment protocols were invented in the United States, and and you know millions upon millions of children orphaned by um, by the ravages of this disease. So what this means to the global economy to the stability of developing nations is you know uh, hard to fathom and you know it's great that there's a, the beginning of a response on a global scale uh, to getting people medications and, right. and treatment there is no cure um, and the, disturbingly in the United States there are new, new statistics that show there's a, a, a sort of a new generation of infection um, among people who have uh, really no reason to be uh, behaving with anything but uh, extreme caution. So they're um, not practicing safe sex. I, I think that it's. Uh, uh, I, I think that that's true, and uh, it's a it's a great worry. Um, I think that there's a there's a widespread misconception that because of the cocktail, uh, that AIDS is cured or it's a maintenance disease. Yeah. But the drugs that you take to stay healthy have a terrible uh, um, effect on the body. The body can't really sustain that amount of chemical infusion on a daily basis. And you have to live with it for the rest of your life. And it's, it's extremely uh, um, hard, it's expensive, and, uh, and ultimately we don't know how long the cocktail will work. I mean, we're still in the fairly early stages of that you know, chapter of the epidemic. So people need to be careful. But when a communicable disease has been around as long as, as AIDS has, uh, it's going to be hard to maintain uh, behavior, and it's uh, it's going to be an ongoing struggle. Is there any hope? Is anything taking place on the on the, uh, the treatment side that that shows? Well, there's, in, there's, for instance, new information today that perhaps protease inhibitors, uh, uh, which is part of the uh, cocktail right. uh, regimen, uh, but that's been are, around for two or three years. Or right, and, and they're now beginning to think that maybe they uh, should sort of shift them over so that you don't start taking them immediately. That the drugs will work without them, and then you can start taking them later, and therefore increase their uh, the, their longevity so that you can stay um, with them more. I mean, like many anti-cancer drugs, part of the name of the game is just making sure that you. Uh, can stay as healthy and responsive to these drugs as long as you can. So there are there are developments like that. As far as I know, as far as I've been reading, there's still no sign of anything that really resembles um, a cure. As it's far a, as I know, it's a rapidly same. shifting vir retrovirus, yeah. and it's uh, going to be tricky and with us in one form or another, you know, for a very long time. Let me take a look at Angels in America. This is Roy Cohn, and uh, played by Al Pacino. And Ethel Rosenberg, as you remember, Ethel Rosenberg died in the electric chair, uh, played by Meryl Streep, and they're talking about Roy Cohn. Here it is. Parts the sea of death, and lets his Roy boy cross over to Jordan on dry land, and still a lawyer. Uh, well, I wouldn't count my chickens, Roy. It's over. Over. How much? If, how much was the original play? How long was the original play? The uh, whole thing is about seven hours, and this is about six hours and fifteen twenty minutes. I don't know. Yeah, the was exact it hard kind. to make it that kind of reductions for you? Um, not really for me. I mean, I did a certain amount of reducing when I was writing the screenplay, and yeah. then f further reduction happened in the editing process. Um, I at first was very worried about cuts um, in it because I, you know, I worked on the play for eight years, and even though it's very long, I felt that I had done. I mean, I've cut at least as much material as you see on stage when you watch the play, is lying in a trunk somewhere. Um, I mean, it was literally cut in half, and its original length was twice as long. Um, I I was worried that I, we were cutting out too much, but I I once I saw the rough cut, I realized that Mike had done. I think an astonishing, and John Bloom, the editor, they, they managed to preserve 
all of uh, what's important in the script and uh, and make it work on television, which is such a different medium, and I think it needed to be thinned out so that you could stand to watch it. It's um, so much closer to you than an actor on a stage, and that, that distance cools things off. This is very, very hot because you're really right there in the room with them, and I think it needed to be thinned out. So, Most people consider this as one of the extraordinary achievements of playwriting and theater. Uh, do you have any sense that, you know, I mean, I've got to climb a very high mountain to top this? Oh, I'm, I've given up. I'm never gonna, I mean, it's just <laughs> never going to happen. I mean, I, I watch it now in the film version, or, uh, and, which is really the first time I'd seen the play in about six years, because I just decided to not look at it anymore. Yeah. And, you know, it feels like I mean, I think I'm a, I'm a wiser person in some ways. I'm 47 now than I was when I was 33 and I wrote this. And, uh, and, and I've read a lot more and I've lived a lot more and I've learned things. There's a kind of an exuberance that I think I had at 30 when I started writing this play and an energy and a happiness. I mean, I've also lost some people who are very dear to me, my mother and some very close friends. And, you know, I've become a graver person, I think, in a certain sense, um, somebody who, as a is appropriate for somebody at 47 is thinking uh, more about mortality and so even though the play is dark uh, there's something sort of joyful in it and I'm not sure that I can find that again and that means that I've entered a new phase in my writing and uh, I like what I'm writing now but Angels will be the I mean, I just did, the first line of I did a children's book with Maurice Sendak just recently, yeah. and, and you know, wherever we go to sign the book, the only thing, this is a man who's written 81 books for children and illustrated 81 books for children. Some of them are, you know, great classics. Everyone comes up and says, where the wild things are, is the, and you know, it's, it, you have to sort of live with that. It's, it's nice to have something that everybody reads. It's also yeah. a little painful because you've done a lot of other work, but you know, I'll live with it. What's second favorite for you? Uh, it, of my work or yeah. Maurice's? No. Um, Yours. I, I, I love all my children. I mean, I have this yeah, new musical that, that uh, Carolina Change, which I think is in some ways the, the um, most tightly constructed thing I've ever written. Um, I'm very proud of Homebody Cobble. I was on yeah, the show we, talking we about, about that. that right. It's coming back to Brooklyn Academy of Music in the yeah. spring and I, in a new version, and I'm very proud of that. And, you know, mm. so, I don't know. It's great to have you here. It's lovely to really be back. Thank you for joining us. See you next time on it uh, right when we were moving the show to Broadway and um, I think for a long time it was uh, seen as something that would have to be made as a theatrical film by a studio and uh, the fact that it's seven and a half hours long at some point in the mid 90s I tried to compress it to see if there was any way to make it short enough to make one film out of it and you can't really do that because there are seven eight major characters um, and uh, Carrie Brokaw really is the person who, the hero of this mm -hmm. whole story. He uh, worked with Altman on The Player and uh, was working with us together on the film. And then when Altman and I decided not to do the film together, uh, Carrie kept it in his back pocket for 10 years and he uh, produced Wit with right. Mike on HBO and called me in the middle of the filming of Wit and said, can I show this to Mike? And I said, sure, because I thought... Show him the treatment. Actually, just show him the, the play and right. say, I, I, I represent this, I, I have the rights for this and I'd like to do it. Um, when you meet Meryl Streep, sort of disappears. And yeah, it's, it's true. thrilling. Yeah. You had good, I mean, Michael, Mike Nichols had good luck in casting this thing, didn't he? Yeah, I don't know who was luck. I mean, I think oh, that's yeah, his, fair, his, fair to say his, that's what he does. Yeah, I mean, he actors who work with him. Meryl's made, I think, three movies with him, four now, yeah. I, more than with any other director, and everybody wants to work with him, so pretty much anyone he asked said they'd do it. Now, why did it take so long to get this movie made? Um, I worked with Robert Altman for a while. I missed her. And I won't make them about you. <laughs> fair enough. I am pleased to welcome Tony Kushner, back to this table. Yeah. It's nice to, to be you. here. Nice to be you. She's amazing, isn't she? She's terrifyingly talented. That's what you I said. Mean, you said yeah. she's inhumanly talented when yeah, we looked at her. It's really scary to watch her work because she becomes another person yeah. entirely and, and the woman that you meet. Tony Kushner is here. A decade ago, he won the Pulitzer Prize for drama with his play, Angels in America. It has now been made into an HBO film directed by the great Mike Nichols. Here is a clip from the film. A homosexual with AIDS, I can just imagine what you... No, think. you can't. Imagine the things in my head. You don't make assumptions about me, 